But you know, if you read John's gospel, and it even alludes to that very early on in the first chapter, but if you really want to cut to the chase and know who Jesus is, all you have to do is, is read that first chapter in John's gospel. You see, it tells us just about everything we need to know about Jesus. That Jesus is the Word made flesh, that he is God who has become flesh and dwells among us, or more literally, God who has pitched a tent among us. We know from chapter 1 that Jesus is God's light shining into the darkness, that Jesus is filled with grace and truth, that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, whom angels bow down to. All is this, all of this is in the first chapter of John's Gospel, my friends. Well, already we know this about Jesus, and he hasn't even done anything yet. And so John, after unpacking who this Jesus is, spends the remainder of his Gospel telling stories that back up the truth about Jesus, that indeed, Jesus is God in all God's glory and suffering who lives among us. You see, John's goal is not just that we know who Jesus is, but that we believe in him and that we believe in God, for it is in believing in him that we catch the unshakable, undeniable glimpse of God's grace upon grace upon grace, upon grace. So, starting in chapter 2, we're only in chapter 2 of John, John begins to tell these stories of Jesus, trusting that when we who are the readers receive them with eyes and hearts of faith, we will believe in Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah. And the story that we heard just a few minutes ago today is only the second story about Jesus that we know about in John's Gospel. It comes right on the heels of a story of the wedding at Cana where Jesus turns the water into wine and reveals his glory for the first time. And the disciples believe in him from this act, this sign. And so this second story that we just heard takes place in Jerusalem not long after during the festival of the Passover. Now, Jerusalem is a busy place during this major festival. People from all over the country, but not only that, but all over the Roman Empire, Jews come together to celebrate the major event in their story, their liberation from slavery in Egypt. For many people, this would have been their first and perhaps only time to visit this ancient and, and glorious city. It would have been the fulfillment of a lifelong dream. They would have been looking forward to this all their lives. Jerusalem, the Passover. Now, perhaps they had arrived to, into the city the week before in time to go through all the necessary purification rituals as outlined by the law, the Torah, outlined that would allow them to enter the temple at the right time. And then maybe about four or so days before that Passover festival, they would have gone to the temple to exchange their Roman coins for temple currency and, and then to register and purchase the best animal they could afford. In all likelihood for this festival, it was a lamb because they needed it for their sacrifice and the Passover meal they would share. They would have been most likely saving up all year for this purchase to buy the best animal they could, sort of like the, the way Christmas clubs operate now, looking forward to that. And once they had made their purchase, it would, be, uh, it would be prepared and given over to the priests who would, in this wonderful ritualistic act of worship and prayer, slaughter the animal, divide it, cook it, offer it to God, and then return a portion back to, uh, to the family or the one bringing the animal for their Passover meal with family and friends. Now, from all historical accounts, this whole scene was a sight to behold. Lines of people everywhere lined up to exchange their currency, to, lined up to purchase animals, vendors calling out the best rates and showing off their good, the smells of food in the air, the sounds of people greeting one another. 
And one of the earliest accounts that we have was written by the historian Josephus, and it implies that hundreds of thousands of people descended on Jerusalem during this Passover festival. Indeed, it was a frenzy of activity, religious activity, economic activity, social activity, maybe similar to all the frenzy and activity that, that happens in our country in the weeks going up to December 25th. You know, it was a great system for all. It worked, it satisfied everyone. It satisfied the pilgrims who came to Jerusalem to keep up their end of the bargain and keeping their relationship with God, uh, with God connected in the hopes that God would look kindly upon them. It worked for the priests who depended on the festival not only for their own support and for the temple, but, to serve, but that they served as mediaries between God and God's people. And it worked for the vendors and the middlemen who were happy to do their part to make the celebration a wonderful event for all and for who were equally happy to receive the economic benefit that came from this festival. It worked. This system had worked for centuries. Nobody had questioned it. It was ingrained into their culture, their practice, their minds, and their hearts. It was, all, it was how they had always practiced their faith. And then here comes Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, Word made flesh, and well, you heard what happened. The system didn't work for him. He drives out the animals, scatters the doves, knocks coins off the table, overturns the money changers' tables. Get these things out of here, he says. You are making my father's house a marketplace. Now, of course, from our perspective over 2,000 years later, it's pretty easy for us to see why Jesus reacted like this. I mean, we who are so far removed to us, it seems obvious that the temple was no longer being seen or received as, as being set apart as that sacred thin space where heaven reaches down and earth reaches up and they come together. The temple was no longer used for that God was no longer in front and center. It seems pretty obvious that instead of God at the temple, it was the temple was used instead as a way to support the larger life, the economy, the society, and the religious life. And so we can see why Jesus might have reacted this way. He took it personally. After all, the temple was his home, and he resented the way it was being used. No wonder he, he said, stop making my father's house a marketplace. I wonder if uh, something similar is happening in the church today. If that marketplace mentality is as much a part of our life as it was a part of life in Jesus' day, I wonder if we're as unaware as the pilgrims and priests and profiteers were in Jesus' day of how we too allow the marketplace to impact our own spiritual lives. Think about it for a moment. The North American church for at least uh, since World War II, has used marketplace language to talk about the church and spiritual life. We shop for a church home in the same way we shop for other goods and services. There's an array of choices that we can choose from, uh, but depending on what we're looking for. Maybe we're looking for a solid children's ministry or the best music in town. Maybe a high-powered, charismatic preacher. Maybe we're looking for a place with plenty of parking. Who knows? Maybe we're looking for a strong outreach ministry. Whatever it is, it's out there, and it works for us. And, and we are so encultured in this system that, that we have a hard time seeing are hearing these words of Jesus, just like perhaps the pilgrims and priests and vendors did. 
And sometimes I wonder if Jesus might be challenging us with that same challenge he gave in Jerusalem. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Then there are the marketplace conversations and questions that happen when church leaders and members get together to plan. I have been part of many uh, conversations like this, I confess. The conversations go and, and the questions go something like this. How can we target the young people? Or how can we go after the families or, or sell ourselves to the artists or the university community? How about those who call themselves spiritual but not Christian? How can we get them? You know, there are hundreds of books out there that try to sell the church, sell us the answers to these questions. And a whole industry of, of cons church consultants has emerged to facilitate church conversations around this conversation and questions with the goal of helping us find a niche and develop a way to market ourselves to meet that niche. Now, I have to tell you, I, I st this is who we are, what we do, this is part of the signs of the time, and I struggle with Jesus saying what he says in this scripture. Because I know that someplace deep, I am caught up in this marketplace system of worship. And I can't help but hear Jesus saying, stop making my father's house a marketplace. And this is, and then, and then what about the communities of faith that seem to prosper and grow by, by selling and promoting self-help philosophies and programs that, that masquerade as the gospel truth? Or what about those who join churches in order to network and make business connections? Or what about others who, who use their resources to, to run the show in their own, own congregations? Might Jesus been, be also saying in these circumstances, stop making my father's house a marketplace? I feel as convicted of this accusation, perhaps as you do right now, and I'm... I share this struggle with you. Because you see, truth be told, when it comes to a life of faith expressed through worship, it's just as easy to justify our own marketplace actions and perspectives as it is to judge the marketplace orientation of the temple system in Jesus' day. You see, marketplace worship, first and foremost, is about devoting our best resources into what works for us. It's about me devoting my resources, my time, my talents to for what works for me and what pleases and feeds and benefits me and us. In marketplace worship, devotion to God is an afterthought at best, not front and center. In marketplace worship, there is no such thing as an action whose sole purpose is to please and praise God. Let me say that again. In marketplace worship, there is no such thing as an action whose sole purpose is to please and praise God. And that's what Jesus was noticing on that day. And perhaps that's what Jesus notices on days like this. Now, I have another confession to make. When I am preparing for a worship service, I hate to admit this, but when I'm preparing for a service, you are my marketplace. I'm the merchant, the vendor. I think to myself, oh, I hope so-and-so likes the hymns this week. Or I wonder if, if you so-and-so are going to send me an email this week about my sermon. Or I wonder if, if you so-and-so will say something to me, something to me at the door. And, and, and I hope what happens here will touch a visitor so you'll come back 
And I confess that more often than not, my thoughts about how God might be receiving our time and what I offer, what we offer, how God might be receiving this is, is secondary to how I might be reacting. How about you? Do you put on your marketplace consumer hat when you come to worship? Now, if you can answer yes to any of these following questions, then welcome to the marketplace. So here they are. One, as you head out to church, do you first wonder if there's going to be anything in it for you, or do you wonder how you might use the hour to offer yourself to God? Number two, do you wonder if you're going to see and greet so-and-so, or do you look forward to the possibility that you might actually see Jesus? During this worship hour, do you let the liturgy lull you to boredom or lead you to life? Are your after, after worship comments more about the music or about the Messiah? As conversations come up during the week, do you offer praise for our programs or praise to our God? Do you talk more about our wonderful space or about our wonderful Savior? How many of you, raise your hand, can say yes to any of these questions? Welcome to the marketplace. And then, of course, the big one is our definition of a successful church, one whose pews are filled with happy, satisfied, custom, I mean, worshipers. Perhaps all of us need to hear Jesus' words, stop making my father's house a marketplace. And perhaps all of us need to confess, Lord, have mercy on us sinners, consumers that we are. But there's good news. And the good news is that this story comes so early in John's Gospel that there's so many more opportunities to see and respond to this Jesus. There's so many opportunities not to become consumers but become, but become consumed by devotion to God and belief in Jesus. The good news is that even as we hear Jesus cry, as we take off our marketplace hats, as we devote ourselves more and more to worshiping God and God alone, as we look for Jesus who will not give up on us, it doesn't matter so much what our worship looks like or feels like or sounds like to us, to me, because it's not about us, it's not about me, it's about God. It's about believing in Jesus who gave himself that the world may know love. And I don't know about you, but I am so glad and so grateful and so relieved and so thankful that our God, our Jesus is merciful and slow to anger, and full of grace, and abounding in steadfast love. Love for you, love for me, love for this marketplace mess of a world. And I can't imagine better news than that. Thanks be to God, and God's people said, Amen. <laughs>